were were the mysterious the guy with the hat or the were they present they, during they the had, they, had, they had gone back to the commander's office they knew when it was over and i got back in that staff that colonel's car and they took me back to the satav building and i got out and they were right there at the door so i couldn't go anywhere i was being watched every i mean really watched you know and i went back in the commander's office and had to do the same reporting in and it was just so strange, man, the, the way the whole, the way it was being, the way in which they handle it. Um, I, I guess it was so new to them too, that they didn't really quite know how to handle it. Yeah. And, uh, so I went back in, reported back to Colonel Spraker, told him everything that, uh, he asked me, he says, is there anything else you want to tell me or anything else you need? And I said, I really can't think of anything else. So he said, well, you're going to have to write, you got to write this down. You got to do a report. And I said, well, I knew that, you know, mm -hmm. I said, yes, sir. So he gave me one of these skill craft pins right here. Just like number two. I think that's what that's called. Skill craft pin, government issued pin. Put me in a little briefing office next to his office there. Nobody left. They are all still sitting out there. Put me in there, closed the door behind me. And I sat there for the next hour and 20, 30 minutes writing a three page report that was in triplicate because back then we didn't have computers and it had carbon copy on the back of the paper. And I don't know the form, but it was a, it was just a standard report security police report form. And, uh, so I finished that and I initialed it and everything dated it and signed it. And I came back out and I put it on his desk and he read it. Looked at it, went through all three pages, made sure it was complete. He said, all right. And then uh, that Jack Reed walked over to him and he wasn't far away anyway, just three or four feet away in a chair. And he walked over and he had some papers in his hand and they were, it was a non-disclosure uh, order. It wasn't an agreement. It was a yeah. down order, you know, mm -hmm. you're not allowed to speak about this to anyone uh, up to and including who you're married to or neighbors he said you do not discuss the, any of this at any point with any people in the media with any newspaper people i mean they cover all the bases there's nothing left out they do know how to do that and i signed it and it, and i was told as long as you're in a response type position work with a nuclear material and dod or they didn't even say anybody else because who can tell the future right mm -hmm. you you're not allowed to speak about this and uh you know or converse with anyone and I said, yes, sir. So after all that was said and done, they allowed me to call my wife and have her come get, pick me up, which was right around three thirty, quarter to four. So I'd been up the entire day prior to, you know, coming out there where I, you know, got up at five o'clock the previous or morning before last. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, then that happened at, all night long. And then the next day, you know, and she came and picked me up. She was uh, completely surprised. She didn't know what to think about that. And, uh, and I really couldn't tell her. And she asked about the band-aids and I really couldn't tell her about that either. And it was, it was just, it really, it really was very difficult. And That's I didn't, hard. That's wow. hard. I, mean, I didn't have, I didn't have any comments that I could really relay. And yeah, I just kept saying, I'm, I'm not allowed to speak about it, you know, which who, who can tell anybody that, you know, I hope he got some sleep during the missing five hours. That would have. I don't know. I have no idea. I have uh, no idea. I didn't feel like. I felt. I. I, and, I and, and it's significant that, that that they must have had reason to believe your story because you went back to work. I mean, yeah. if, they, if they thought you were making this up or that you were crazy, they're not going to let you go out and guard nuclear no. missiles. No. And Michael Johnson, I kept asking about, and I just kept getting pushback on that. Do not worry about Mike, the senior Michael Johnson. Did you ever he see him again? Fine. Well, it was about almost three weeks later, he came to my apartment. And he was a single guy living in the barracks. And he asked some people where I live downtown in, in Rapid City. And uh, what's funny about that is I remember that day, just like I'm talking to you guys right now. But before he came, I sensed him and he knocked on my door. And I lived on the third floor in this apartment complex, which I went back to when I went out there in 2021 with Discovery Plus. I went right back to those apartments and just tried to re-step, go over every step where I had been and what I had done, you know, and related directly to that incident. The only thing I didn't do the first day was haul butt out there to November, November Control and then November 5 because they asked me not to. I guess they 
they wanted to get my response on camera, which was a farce because they didn't show any of that, you know, to start with. Uh, even though we filmed, you know, forever, it seemed, and then just eight minutes of it was used. And uh, mm -hmm. there was a whole lot that, that was, you know, I, uh, I don't know why networks like to do that to people. You know, they, they seem so interested and then you go do it and then they backtrack on it all and just show little points and snippets of it and then go on to, you know, a missile launch officer that's underground 60 feet that his enunciator panel is lit up, never saw a damn thing. You know, he's not, they're not the ones out there. That's mm -hmm. what, that's the only thing I'm going to say. I'm not taking anything away from them because yeah. they have a, you know, explicit job to do too. But visually, mentally, and all other sens sensually, you know, you come up on something like this. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and the show that you're talking about uh, for, for people uh, watching or listening that don't know, that's, this, this was the unidentified show that was uh, a series uh, well, the by, by, to the Stars Academy for. Uh, uh, that was the first one. Yeah. This was Discovery Plus and Alien Endgame. Alien and okay, I didn't see that. Yeah. I've seen the, I saw the, um, the uh, unidentified, unidentified, yeah, segment. Yeah, as a matter of fact, um, you know, I, I, I spoke with Lou. Lou called me a little bit later, and he, and he was a little disappointed also, uh, in that whole thing. He didn't have any input in that, mm -hmm. and because uh, it really torqued me off. First of all, a producer used my name as, and he had called me the day before it was to, or two days before it was to air. And he said, because I'm putting, doing your name tags. He goes, how, how do you pronounce your name as with you guys? I told you, well, what do you think about Mario? Yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and then, uh, then when he says out of nowhere, uh, Woods and his partners, weapons were, were removed immediately. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they were relieved of their weapons, immediately relieved of their weapons. Man, I went at the root. Because that's a, what's that make me sound like? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, uh, that's that's a... Uh, and I think that was included in the narration, if I, if I remember correctly, right? Yeah, that, that really... Was, it, wasn't, it wasn't like Lou, wasn't Lou Elizondo or Chris Mellon no. saying that. No, no. Yeah. And, and and Lou called me. He said, I apologize for it. He said, I should have never been like that. Yeah. And a few others that... that, that in our, in our group, you know, we talked about that quite a bit. And, uh, I said, yeah, I can't believe they did that, you know, but, um, uh, but in it, alien end game, I mean, it, I would, they took me there. Discovery plus took me back there, which I thought was the coolest thing to be able to go there and have a free trip, you know, to go back to South Dakota and mm -hmm. see everything again, what it's like today compared to what it was in the seventies, you know, and it's changed a great deal, but the missile site the launch control facility is exactly the same. November, November five is of course got a building on it now and the rancher uses it, but the producer did not want to have the facility in the picture frame. Mm -hmm. So we, they stopped the vehicle about a hundred yards down uh, to the, to the east of November five and just filmed an open barren field and said, this is where it happened at. That's not, you know, mm -hmm. all they got me I'm standing there on, I can still see this thing in my, in my mental mind. I'm not only seeing it, I feel it and I'm smelling it, man. I thought I was going into AFib for when I got out of that vehicle, yeah. you know, on, on Ormond road. And, uh, everyone knew in Newell knew that had a suspicion we were filming, didn't know what it all related to. And this is a cool part. Um, those 25 or 30 people were, were just traveling up and down this dirt road, Ormond road as we're filming. Right. And really I've got my booklet that those drawings are contained in, in front of me. And they've got a drone sitting over my shoulder. That's looking at those, at those drawings. And I'm looking out into a field. Well, it was overwhelming. I, I mean, I just had tears coming down, man. Mm -hmm. And uh, Rich Emerling, he Emerling, he um, he was the host, and he used to host um, live PD. Uh, he's got a patch on one of his eyes. Great guy, man. I I miss him, and uh, I talk to him often. And uh, he kind of offered me some comfort, where you know, not knowing me from Adam, but yet feeling what I was feeling because he was like my host all day long and my escort, you know, pretty mm -hmm. much. And uh, we, we struck up a really good friendship and, and we, we've maintained it and going to keep it that way. Yeah. I need to go to him out in Austin. 
But while we were there, I got to tell you this. Yeah. Uh, these people showed up that lived there. And uh, one guy was on a uh, an enclosed like a uh, Honda four wheeler. You know, I like I think they used to call them. Uh, there was a certain name for them. They were, my sister had one. I can't remember what it was, but it had an enclosed cockpit on it, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, another guy was on an open wheel four wheeler and they were just off the side of the road watching what was going on. His cars go up and down this dirt road watching us. All these ranchers and their wives and their family. And it was really a spectacle, I guess, because, you know, today's population is 640 or something like that. Mm-hmm. So, And there's one school building that kind of thing. And a beautiful little town. And these two guys, when filming was over and the camera crew had departed. Now, mind you, we hadn't been to New Lake Reservoir yet. I didn't know where that was. I didn't know how to get there. I, 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 it was like a ghost location to me. I had no idea. I didn't even know it was called that. I didn't know where it was. All I did was describe a lake, but these two guys stood, stayed behind in their four wheelers. And, uh, so I'm standing on the side of the road talking to Rich Emberlin and the producer's talking to somebody on the phone. And uh, the guy in the in the open wheel four wheeler, he came over. He says, are, he says, are you the guy this all happened to? And I said, yeah, I said myself and my partner who we, can, we were trying to find. And a lot of money has been spent trying to find Michael Johnson. And uh, with private investigators and police officers and retired personnel that have that capability, you know. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, he said, well, he goes, I was a deputy sheriff in Sturgis. They dispatched two of us up here all those years ago. He said, I'm way retired. And he, you know, he looked, <laughs> he looked pretty, pretty hard an individual. He goes, they dispatched us up here to hunt for a security police patrol that we never found. And I said, are you sure you're talking about the same? He said, oh yeah. Oh Yeah. It was in November, so there's a secure there's a there's a blotter, police blotter with that date on it of what I'm telling you. That and, is uh, wild. I was like, "You're kidding me!" So we got his name and we got his name and everything. And he told me, he "said Yeah, they never located us. They came right here to the site." He said, "Yeah, we came right here. And you weren't here." Wing security control back at Ellsworth Air Force Base did call and dispatch local and state officials to come search for us along with the six security patrol teams that were looking for us or, or six security policemen, three patrols. Mm-hmm. The other guy that was in the enclosed four wheeler in the Honda, he gets out and he comes over and joins the conversation. His father was a state patrolman and that was his area or region. He got the call at two o'clock in the morning to come and assist and find us, look for us. His bedroom was just off from the kitchen there in the plains area in in where he lived in his house, still lives in that house today. He said, they welcomed me to come to his home. He said he heard the phone ring and got up and didn't get up, but his dad got up and answered the phone and he was sitting on the side of his bed when his father said, well, he goes, those guys are better armed than I am. Why do you want me to go look for him? And his father was a state patrolman, but he did leave to come look for us. His father saw a object in the sky, a bright object in the sky. Oh. Yeah, after two o'clock. So um, that really, that really blew up the whole conversation between myself and Rick Emberlin and oh. and even the producer. Now the producer was ready to go. Like I said, he just let the whole camera crew go. And I and I asked him. I said, Well, where would this lake be that? That, or, or where would this wall be? I didn't even know it was a damn lake. I never even saw it before. Mm-hmm. He goes, You're talking about uh, New Lake Reservoir Dam. And I said, well, where is it? So he says, go back up to the stop sign, take a left, and go straight about 11 miles. And it'll be on your right about three miles off the main highway. So being that the camera guys were gone, this fellow Greg let him go. And the drone operator, uh, it was just myself, producer Greg, and Rich Emberlin. So off we struck it. Now he didn't want this, the producer didn't want to go. But Rich Emberlin said, We're going. This man came this far. We're going to go the rest of the way. Mm-hmm. I took a little video passing November 5 
because he didn't want to stop it directly. And why it is, I don't know. He didn't want to stop in front of the missile site of November 5. I wanted to stand right where my vehicle was sure. parked. Yeah. I wanted to be there. Yeah. I know the feeling I had 100 yards down the road. So no telling what I could have sensed there. I don't know. And uh, so anyway, we, we drove and went up Highway 79 going north. And where Missile Road is, uh, November 1 Missile Road, it was on up the road about four and a half more miles. And then it just had a small little like a DNR sign said New Lake Reservoir Dam and a board, you know, and turn right. Went off the road about three and a half, four miles. Followed this road. And the first thing I saw was a tree. And it's an old, I don't know if it's an oak. I don't know what kind of trees are really out there. Most trees of the state trees should be a mall bell telephone pole because there's more of them than there are trees. Mm-hmm. And they're down in the Black Hill area, you know. Mm-hmm. This tree looks like an old Western hanging tree in a movie. It, there's no leaves or anything on it, just big old branches. And it's still there after all these years. Yeah. It was on a curve. I remember it. I remember seeing it that morning when it got light before uh, Sergeant Garza and them guys pulled up. I remember seeing that tree and it's still there, man. It's amazing how things can just throw your memory in the, in the running, you know? Mm-hmm. And uh, so we get to, we get down in there and it's just wide open, you know, I mean, the road's just nice and clear and you come up on this dam and then down behind it is, is that wall at that 45 degree angle that ran the whole length of it. And you can see it on Google earth. I should have sent you a picture of it. Uh, and we were right down in the center of that, of that dam on the backside of it. Now, what really gets me is these, these F these F 150s that we had, they were not four wheel drive vehicles. They were just two wheel drive vehicles. Mm-hmm. And where we were located, there was no space, no area that you could turn around in. Now, the ground was covered in snow, like a foot, foot and a half, two foot of snow everywhere else. But where we were was mud. So the only way we could have gotten there, which would have been tire tracks, and there were none. We made fresh tire tracks and we left there. I Mm -hmm. I remember that. There was no tire tracks to get out of there. Where Sergeant Garza's vehicle stopped is where the last tire tracks were. And we were sitting over here, way over here, way different, facing that direction. We were facing the only direction we could face to get out of there. Because mm-hmm. we'd been in any other direction, I couldn't have turned around. And there was no, there's, because you drop, if Michael Johnson would have opened his door, if he'd have been, <laughs> if he could have done that and stepped out, he'd, if he'd have taken two steps to his left, he'd have gone down an embankment about 40 feet into a smaller, frozen pond mm-hmm. and that, that's the retention overflow pond for this dam you can see it on google earth if you pull up new lake yeah. for that. so do you do you so attribute cool. the do you and you i this is kind of what i'm assuming or maybe i'm you know imagining i mean the mud around there some heat some heat source had to have something created had to melt this. the snow and the yeah and the and the uh the earth yeah everything else was completely frozen yeah everything wow. Is not where we were standing. I just, well, I just spent six months, I spent all last winter in Calgary, which is very similar winters, and uh, it, it would take that, a lot of heat to turn, to create mud out there. That piece of igneous rock I picked up the day we were there, and uh, that was the only rock down there where I was standing, and uh, it just means something to me. Yeah. But that is this is volcanic igneous granite, and it's beautiful piece i can't believe they let me fly with it mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah you know yeah what i did i put me a little number on here 15.99 like i bought it right mm-hmm. i didn't know what else to do but i and i also have a, a fire hydrant handle which was at the lcf from the yeah. number one as a souvenir but to so finish it we're down there and um rich is giving him hell he says why did you let the camera guys go for you know, you here. Here's the other part of the story. We just discovered it, you know, and we had we, he had an iPhone 12. This Greg did. So he did some videos of this, this iPhone 12. Just me talking to Rich, which, you know, never made anything. They never, yeah. never did anything with it. I've got the video and it was kind of crappy, but uh, it really bothered me that they took they took so little interest in that. And uh, what I discovered, honestly, after all said and done, when I first saw that object at 9.05 or whatever time it was that night, 
That thing was over Newell Lake Reservoir Dam. I associate it completely with a Pythagorean triangle, as you see in that design and that shape on that map, mm -hmm. from point A to point B and then to the New Lake Reservoir as that. And further, how would anything or anybody know that that's the closest launch control launch facility to the LCF? I mean, they could have gone hell they could have gone on the other side of castle rock where we have a bunch more where other sites are located november 8 november 9 10 you know they were all in different locations but this was the closest to that little town of newell mm -hmm. and the closest to november control so i and i mean it's directly right outside one road of newell i mean ormond road is there's a golf course on the left side of ormond road today mm -hmm. Now, how strange is that? And then that object to be at that dam. Mm -hmm. And that's where I saw it. Wow. Standing outside November Control, looking to my right, there was that object in the air. And I'm, I'm positive it was over that dam. Wow. And I'm saying, and, and when, you, when you sort of came to consciousness in, in front of that dam, it was as though your truck had been dropped there. Put there. Yeah. Yeah, behind the dam, not in front of it, behind yeah. it. Behind the dam, yeah. but like the is there no tracks coming in or out. Yeah, um, and, just placed there. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm. Wow. It's so baff. It's so baffling. I'm curious. You, you had started to. You had mentioned that uh, Michael Johnson had a come to your apartment three weeks yeah. later. Mm -hmm. What was his? Yeah. What? It, what was his assessment of this entire event? Well, that's when who I was married to found out what had happened, and. Uh, during that time, before those three weeks, you know, I, uh, I, I had dreams from hell, apocalyptic world enders, you know, uh, earthquakes, uh, uh, atomic explosions, um, uh, flooding, uh, major catastrophes in the atmosphere. Just, I mean, just, uh, just a plethora wow. of just unbelievable end time thoughts. And I don't know where that came from or anything like that. He had had that also. Yeah. And I got, and I really got interested in pyramids. Uh, when I saw Close Encounters of the Third Kind in a local theater in Rapid City with my wife, that part where he's sitting in front of when he's there trying to figure out the power outage, why? And he sits in front of the mailboxes and he's got the flashlight in his mouth and he's reading a map. And all of a sudden, you know, lights appear behind him. And he waves them around and then they go up instead of around. And then the beam of light hits him. And if you notice in that picture, you see the dust flying through the atmosphere. And it seems like he's being shocked inside. He's, he's kind of moving kind of strange, like he's being programmed or something like he's being, I don't know, something's being put in his mind. I don't really know how to, how else to describe that. But, uh, that part, I was sitting in that seat with my sitting next to my wife. I broke out into a sweat and I got up out of that theater and I took off to the main street in Rapid City. I just ran out of that theater and sat out there on the sidewalk in the cold air and I just had to breathe. Yeah. I, I, and she came out a few minutes later thinking I'd just gone to the restroom or something, but she came right. to find me. And I, I said, I, I feel as if that's been, that just happened to me for real. And Michael Johnson that day, we drew right away, you know, I introduced him to her and I hadn't even really spoken much to, uh, about him to her at all. So I introduced her to him and I, I sat down and I said, well, she's going to find out today. I'm pretty sure she'll keep it quiet, but you know, maybe the end of us per se, once I relay all this information, because that's pretty hard for, you know, anybody to swallow even back, even back then, especially, you know, mm -hmm. uh, even today, um, uh, people, you know, you know, my own family, so not my kids, but, you know, people related like my wife's side or something like that. They look at me kind of sideways, which doesn't, I don't care. You know, it is what it is. I'm too old to run and don't give enough. Just don't just don't care about it. You know, right. Right. form your own opinion. So anyhow, uh, we I said immediately I gave him a piece of paper and I said, you sit here and I'm going to sit over here. We're going to draw what we saw. Oh. And. He drew the same craft that I drew. He knew of the object in front of the windshield. He couldn't, and he heard 
the most important thing was do not fear. That's what I haven't even said anything about that, but that was the biggest thing that kept being pushed into my mind was do not fear during do the not experience. Fear. No, that was right. when they were approaching the, that's when they were approaching the vehicle. The do, not were approaching. Right. do not fear. So he heard that as wow. And he heard that also, but he had the most secret piece of information that I, that I, that floored me. And I, and I said, I said, weren't you sore for days? The way you were clutching that steering wheel, yeah. man, I said, and he didn't remember any of that. He didn't, but he, he was, but he was conscious of, of the, the, the he was sphere conscious, and conscious he, he of don't the remember beans. me yelling at him or pushing him or po poking him in the ear. He don't remember doing anything to him. Yeah. He doesn't remember that. He Does, didn't remember. Did he remember that ammonia smell? Yes. He remembered that. Wow. Something he told me that I didn't even think about. He told me now, mind you, an F-150 Ford has got a uh, rubber black floor, floor mats and, uh, he said, I saw your glove and these were not just gloves. These were, these were, uh, air force pilot mittens for super cold weather. It's a B 52 bomber pilot or, uh, a, a, a crew member that gave me this. And they, they cover all three of these fingers and your index finger is free to operate your weapon mm -hmm. and, um, and your thumb. And then they go all the way down and lock into your parkas with a pull strap on two pull straps. So they're, so they're secure. So, right. and they have their, their kangaroo skin, they're yellow and they got this big brown fur on the back of them. They're real expensive and super sought after gloves. I can't even find a pair today. Not that I need them, but I want them. I like mm -hmm. that, you know, but he goes, I saw your glove on a shiny floor. And I said, what are you talking about? He says, your gloves. He goes, I saw one of your gloves. He says, I saw a glove on a shiny floor. I said, we don't have shiny floors in this F one in that F one fifty. He goes, I know, but I saw your glove on a shiny floor. Mm -hmm. Oh boy. So I said, just a minute. So we just had a one bedroom apartment with a little living room and a kitchen and stuff. And I ran into my bedroom and over in the corner, I kept my, my ditty bag, you know, my carry bag. You carry everything and, you know, you carry your life in there. When you're away from home, you got all your clothing and toothbrushes, everything. You carry everything in that hawk bag. I ran in and grabbed it and I just unzipped it and put it on the couch. And he's standing there and I just took, I, my wife was a little upset. I just flipped the damn thing over on the couch and just spread everything out. And there was my left hand glove, but no right hand glove. I never recovered that right hand glove. Mm -hmm. So. I guess I left a right hand glove with him forever. I don't really know. Yeah. So, and, and you've never, uh, gone through any kind of like hypno regression to try and figure out what happened in those. Yeah. That yeah. I've been through, you did that. Yeah, I've been through two sessions. I've, I've got a uh, one on DVD and then I just did one, uh, February before last, um, uh, with Yvonne Smith of Ciro in LA mm -hmm. when, I was out there, out there filming uh, with a producer and I can't talk about that one. That's supposed to come out here anytime now, but uh, yeah. it's really good. It's supposed to be at the theater. I understand. So at what point, well, I am, I am curious what your wife's response was to just this yeah, experience in general, but, but also after that, just when, when did you start that journey of discovery um, in terms of what might've happened in that time? I didn't do uh, hypnosis for quite some time. Matter of fact, uh, I was listening to coast to coast one night, which I love coast to coast. And I work for this shipping company out of Norway. I sit up on a dock at night while I'm working a ship because I was in charge of the, I was in charge of the vessels, all the equipment that was used to go on or off or take what's on or go or put what's on it or take off what's on it. Uh, whatever we were doing, loading or unloading, then, uh, I listen to coast to coast and I hear, uh, Robert Hastings and something about him just clicked with me. And that really, that was, uh, that was probably 2000. That's probably 2014, 2015 or something like that. Yeah. And I'm and just, that, yeah, and I'm would just you say yeah. Robert Hastings was the man who wrote a book called UFOs and nukes. Yeah. That yeah. The, but he produced a movie UFOs and nukes and he, yes. and he did a book. He's done two books now. And, uh, I'm in, I'm in his second book, which is Confessions. Oh, and, I, haven't, uh, oh I haven't read that one. And that's, uh, that's relatively new. And uh, I think he's working on another one right now. And 
I know Lou is, but I, I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not sure if it's a, it's a combined effort or what, but I don't want to get ahead of myself. And uh, I really don't know what she thought because she really didn't ask too many questions uh, pertaining to the whole thing. I, I don't think she thought it was real. I thought maybe, maybe she thought, and it was made up or what have you, but Michael Johnson kind of put the kibosh on that when he showed up and, and, you know, and stated the things he did and drew the same pictures that I drew and, and asked me about pyramids in which I went pyramid nuts, man. I had to, I had to read about every pyramid that's ever been built on this planet. Those which we know of and those which we do not know of. And, uh, you know, my, my father, he was from Banaka, Honduras, and um, he used to tell me of uh, structures on their property growing up as a boy that had never been excavated in, in pyramids. And, you know, he always said there was something about them, but he didn't want to go into it. I mean, he, he was, he was uh, not educated like we're educated today, but he was at sea probably by 16 or 17 years old and later went to technical schools after he and my mother met and um and that you know helped him a great deal to achieve a chief engineer status you know working for texaco and uh and then unfortunately he was in a car accident in 73 and uh and deceased um at 40 43 years old mm-hmm. yeah. and that was my first day of my senior high school year so it changed it literally changed everything within my family structure you know yeah but my wife she really didn't uh she asked me some questions, but I think she held reserve in that thought that <clears throat> she didn't know how to accept that. Mm-hmm. And I understand. I understand it. I only know that it, and I only know what happened to me. And Michael Johnson was there as well. Uh, I don't know if he was burned. He didn't say he was burned, and he should have been on the left side of his face because the entire time that object was on the left side of him. And he was more subject to that. Now the window was up and I don't know if that may have protected him somewhat. And being that my window was down and I got up on that windowsill, but whatever was exposed was burned like a sunburn, not a burn burn, mm-hmm. but like a sun, you know? And uh, he didn't say, but, um, but it's amazing what he drew and what he stated and what he heard and what I didn't think that he heard or thought he didn't see. And he did. And then he left and he, you know, when he left that apartment that day, I was going to see him, you know, somewhere. I knew I would. And it was as if he just vanished, man. And next thing I know, when I got that, when I got that assignment to Osan Air Base Korea, it was, it could have been an accompanied tour, meaning you could take your spouse with you if you elected, if you volunteered to stay for two years. Well, I went to my commander, Colonel Spraker, and he really didn't like seeing me, uh, which was which was a strange feeling, and I knew it was directly in relation to this whole deal, this whole sighting. Mm-hmm. And um, and I I showed him my orders, and I said, Colonel Sprecher, I said, any way we could get these amended or changed to where I can go for two years and I'll take my wife with me. Right. And he literally just slammed his hand down on this. He says, Absolutely not, young man. He says, You are going remote alone. Oh. And that was just. And I didn't know, I, I, you can't, re, you know, you can't refute what a colonel says. And I guess I could have gone to the base commander, but that would have really been bad to do that, to go above his head, you know, to go up you know, full bird colonel's head. But mm-hmm. so anyway, it ended up destroying everything anyway. And um, I was, I was gone for a year and, uh, and it just fell apart. But when I got back, everything was just done, you know, pretty much. Yeah. Mm. That's terrible. And yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I understand. That's that. all right. That's all right. Yeah. I love the day by God. It's all right. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, that's kind of the, the history of this subject is strewn with people who've had their lives very, mm-hmm. very seriously disrupted. Absolutely. And is. Lost, you know, a lot tons of marriages and careers destroyed by, by having these experiences. Um, I have had people come up to me and I, and I got to relay this and I don't know, you know, if this experience did anything internally to me or in, in a way of like mind expansion or anything like that. But twice in my life, uh, I've had this, uh, 
I should say, I don't want to call it an interlude, but I had a, uh, a thought to talk to a person that I had no idea that did not even know or anything like that. One was in a, uh, a, a, a like a Home Depot store mm-hmm. and it was a lady one day, an older lady. And something compelled me just to simply say, ma'am, did you have something st- really strange happen in your life that, that you have questions about? I know that seems like an open-ended question, but walk down your local street and ask anybody that question. Mm-hmm. And that's what they say to you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, they probably think, hey, what the heck? Well, what's wrong with you? Why would you even say something like that? Yeah. And your lady looked like she almost lost her breath and she turned and looked at me. And she said, how would you know that? And I said, no, what? I said, something just told me to ask you that question. And I don't even know what it is. I said, have you seen something that's out of this world or, you know, that you can't explain? And she relayed what her and her mother had seen in a vehicle and pulled off the road. And then she had two hours of missing time, her and her mama at the same time. Mm-hmm. She had missing time. And, and, just... yeah, and she was a teenager when that happened. And she was probably well in her late sixties, early seventies when I saw her at home Depot, wow. just out of the wood. And the other was basically the same. And, uh, it was at a, um, at an outdoor grill in, uh, in Tampa. Uh, and it was an older lady just sitting there by herself and something just told me to ask her this and to ask her basically that question. And she, she again looked at me and said, how would you, how would you know that? I said, I have no idea, ma'am. I just knew I needed to ask you, had you ever encountered or seen something that's not of this world or you didn't, you know, or you'd had no, you had no words to describe it. And it happened to her and her son when her son was in his mid twenties and, you know, and she was 50 years old mm-hmm. and, and she just, she even said, you know, there were beings that she remembered. She said, I could never her and her husband. You know, she says, I could never tell my husband because he, you know, would think I'm crazy. And, uh, my son and he don't have a relationship because of it today. So I just thought that was, and you know, we talked and I, I kept up with her for a little bit. That one, I didn't keep up with the lady in home Depot, but as so many years ago, but twice that's happened, you know, and in different States. So I don't know if it's a recognition thing that people have or. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's not an uncommon story from people who've had uh, experiences or, you know, contact with UFOs that after that they've, they've developed uh, a precognition or clairvoyance. Mm -hmm. Um, It seems like that's a fairly common um, story amongst people who've had these, you know, extraordinary experiences like yours. You know, um, so so certainly, yeah, not, not unheard of. Yeah. It blew my mind away. I know that I never would have expected that. And and why to even ask something like that of someone yeah. I've never had anybody ask me, but I, I have asked two people that I yeah. somehow so you feeling or something about them. Yeah. To ask them. Yeah. Yeah. And what you know, it's, uh, and I've got to say something. Sorry. When you hear this language, like do not fear. Mm-hmm. Um, it is as if every cell in your body is vibrating to make a word. It's like you're being talked to through the aqueous cell structure of your body, not, not hearing audibly like we're doing now, yeah. but it like comes from within you. And it's uh, a physical sensation. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I believe it is, but it's, yeah. it's, uh, cause I didn't know what I was hearing. Is it, is it, is it the word of God? What, what is that? What, who, how, how can you, uh, understand something that's nonverbal like that, mm-hmm. but yeah, clear as a bell, no background noise, nothing. It almost as if you, I don't know if you've ever seen any of the Harry Potter stuff. I mm-hmm. watched it when the kids were coming up. There was a uh, one where he's evident. He's talking to a snake or something or a snake's talking to him and yeah. it has that on it. That's what it sounds like. 
Wow. And it's inside of you. And uh, there's, there's, there's no misidentification. You know, something, some, you know, something's speaking to you. Yeah. Clearly, uh, clearly you've carried some, some trauma from this experience, like this, some PTSD uh, from this experience. Like it, and and I'd, I'd say it's even with you all these years later. Right. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yep. I mean, there's definitely an emotional component to what you, you know, to this experience even now. You know, Dave, there's not a day or a night that goes by that I don't study the stars, that I don't look. And there for a while before I ever left South Dakota, if they were in proximity or whatever they are, were in pro- close in proximity of, of if I was in the field, I could feel it. Yeah. I could feel it. Didn't see them, but I could feel it. But you did. Yes. Yeah, so I knew did. they were. You they were somewhere. Like you were, there. Yeah, you were getting, you were picking up a, a sense of them. Yes. So it wasn't, so the, yeah, so the, no, uh, the experience didn't end no. that, didn't end with that, that uh, 24 hour period. Say that again. The experience didn't end. It wasn't just no. that, that experience. You've mm-hmm. had, it's an, an ongoing sensation mm-hmm. that this, uh, whatever this, whatever these beings are, whatever is behind yes. what you saw are, are, are about and and you can pick up on it which is really Absolutely. that's really interesting yeah i know right for a fact i mean it believe me i, I it, my hairs will just raise up on my back and neck if if i sense them right now i mean yeah. Yeah. i'm not saying that i have but yeah but i have in the past have you had and any more visual experiences since then december 17 2017 in my bedroom this house right here mm-hmm at 4 11 a.m i was awakened i've never slept walk in my life i work rotating shifts so i have my own room back here in the back of the house uh i work 12 hour shifts as i was saying six to six vice versa mm-hmm. and uh at 4 11 because i looked at the clock when it happened i awoke to every low voltage alarm. I don't even know if you know these things exist in your home, like in your refrigerator, your electric stove, your microwave oven, uh, anywhere there's some type of a voltage regulator on any piece of equipment you may have that's plugged in. If there's a low voltage sense, then these alarms go off like I've never even knew. I didn't know they existed. 411, I wake up, my whole house is singing with these alarms and all the lights are like this, just as dull as they could possibly be, just barely staying on. These are incandescent LED lights in my house, in my own. Yeah. And for one flash, I saw a hole in my wall in my bedroom, which I have a picture of it I can send to you mm-hmm. that I drew. Yeah. And it's about a five foot diameter hole, and there's, there's two dressers with just a little bit of open wall space between it. And there was an open hole, but there were sparks. <laughs> That's what brought my attention to it. There were like sparks, the very end of a, like a end of a sparkler, just a couple of sparks shot out from either side of it to blackness. Don't know where that, don't know where it led to, don't know what that was. Mm -hmm. But as soon as I was realized I was standing at the foot of my bed, facing the North wall in my house, when that happened and these alarms are going off, my son popped through my door and he goes, dad, what, what he's in his bedroom. He goes, what the hell's going on? What is that sound? And I said, I don't know, son. I literally grabbed a gun. I don't know if I was being broken into. I didn't know, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm, I'm very well trained. So mm-hmm. I didn't know if somebody's breaking in my home or what. I couldn't understand what had just happened in front of me. So I go all through the living room, everything, everybody else asleep everywhere except me and my son and I, and he's huge. He's, he's really a big boy. I mean, he's in shape, works out five, six hours a day. I mean, you wouldn't believe it. And, uh, all these alarms were going off and I kept thinking, what kind of, what is this? And they stopped finally. I mean, and the lights were still just mm, like this real dim. Nothing would come on full brightness. Everything was everything was much, much lower intensity than what it was supposed to be. A 90 watt was not, 
or a 60 watt bulb was like 10 watts or something. I, I don't know. Like you had a dimmer switch going up and down with it, you know? Yeah. Are, is this bringing, I mean, are you having, you know, are you having flashbacks? I mean, are you, is it, is, is that in your mind? No, no, or are you real. just, this has happened. No, no, I know, but I, yeah. I, I'm saying, are what you were thinking? Were you associating it with your past experiences with UAP stuff, or are you just thinking burglar? I mean, you're just thinking. I, I didn't know what to think. I didn't okay. associate it with UAP stuff or with anything. I just something was bad, and I and I said I got to, you know, I got to go into protection mode here. So uh, I came through the house, kind of searching and clearing the house. You know, the clock, the battery power clocks were running, the electric clocks, they were doing something weird, the clock on the stove and all that. And uh, anyway, I told my son, I said, I don't know what to do about any of it, son. I, I, I unplugged the microwave because I couldn't get that alarm to stop. Uh, the stove stopped and the refrigerator stopped. And I think there was something else, and I can't recall what that was, but. I said, I'll call Georgia Power when I get up. So I said, I'm going to go back to bed. So I went and laid down, shaking my head. Of course, I couldn't sleep. And I just did fall asleep. And at about 8 o'clock, my, my son had gotten up for work. And he came and knocked on my door. And he opened the door and says, Dad, he goes, Georgia Power's here. And I said, what? I said, did you call him? <laughs> no, and he didn't. Mm -hmm. he said, no, he says, they're out front. And I live on a little over an acre here. And there's 15 homes in this neighborhood. And they were out by my front street where the box comes in, you know, where the power supply comes in to, to my home. And uh, so I, I get all dressed and everything. And I go out my front door. And it's probably 820, 830. And they're out there digging and doing all kinds of stuff. Got sensor equipment and everything. And. And uh, before I even got there, the supervisor, he goes, hey, he goes, we, uh, we've got a cart on your side of your house by your meter, which was my trash cans and everything are stored. And he says, I had to put a third leg into your home. He says, you burned up a leg of power in your house. And I said, I don't know what that means. What, what do you mean? And uh, I guess you have three legs that supply the voltage for your home in a ground. Mm -hmm. uh, it comes into your box. And one of those legs was burned out. And uh, this house was built new in 96 and we're the second owners here. And, uh, and I just looked at him, I said, well, damn, man. I said, how many other homes in the neighborhood are messed up like this? And he looked at me kind of surprised. He says, just you. I go, what? I said, how, did, how could that happen? I said, I'm not running any welding equipment or anything like that. Uh, how could that happen? He goes, we don't know, but you, you lit up our boards down, down at the station like the 4th of July out here. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, how does that even, how can that be? I said, we were all asleep. He goes, well, something happened. And, you know, it was really strange so that, so that thing that was jumpered into my, uh, that, that portal in there. Huh? So maybe that, that portal that appeared in your wall. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, and there's a better part to this. So I was just shaking my head and thinking what I'd seen because it was just a, a just a minuscule part of my memory when I'm and why was I standing up? I never sleepwalked. Mm -hmm. I was standing there in boxer shorts, looking at a, the wall in my bedroom this far from a dresser, you know, this in front of me in a five foot diameter hole with a just a a spark just went out as my son popped through that door. I mean, it was all just like that, you know. Now, I call Robert Hastings about it, of course. I, I, I kind of go over with him everything that uh, comes upon me and that kind of thing, kind of get his approval. If, it, if Robert don't like it, I don't do it. That's just that mm -hmm. simple. I'm really, I trust yeah. him. Yeah. You know? And he knows it, and I tell him so. And uh, so I photographed, you know, the, the, I mean, they had a huge transformer out there on dolly wheels. And had it plugged into my electrical uh, box. And I, I got pictures of it. And uh, I guess it was maybe two weeks later. Because they came out three or four days later while I was at work. And they repaired the line. Put a new line down or whatever they had to do. And it was two or three weeks later. I was out cutting my grass. And this boy lives two down, two doors down from me. Uh, uh, last name's Watley. He uh, came by in his truck and he rolled his window down. And he said, hey, Mr. Woods, how you doing? Him, my son, used to play, shoot bows and arrows, arrows and all that stuff, you know, shoot guns or whatever. And he goes, um, 
And he goes, Mr. Woodsy, because what was all that stuff in your backyard the other night? And I said, what are you talking about? He goes, man, I was leaving for work early. He doesn't live there anymore, but, you know, his mama does. Mm -hmm. And he goes, man, your he said, your yard was lit up in the back like Hollywood searchlights. And I said, wait, I said, that can't be pot. What are you talking about, man? He goes, man, he says the whole back area back there because I'm backed up to woods. And uh, he goes, it lit up like the 4th of July back there. And I just didn't even know what to say. And I said, well, wait, I don't have any. I just have normal spotlights on the corners of my home, you know, two 150s. And they're facing the ground. They're not facing up, you know, and I, they're on each corner of the house. And I couldn't figure that out, but I've never forgot that statement. He said, oh, my God. He says, that whole backyard was lit up. And he's been in my backyard hundreds of times. And, he, you know, they're, you know, been yeah. all through my home and fed him and everything else. And he just couldn't believe it. And I just walked in and I told my son, I said, man, you need to talk to Wade to see what else he, he may have seen that one morning when, you know, the power flipped out. And I thought I saw that hole and all that stuff, you know, because mm-hmm. I'm still thinking, you know, I thought I saw I did or didn't, you know, I'm really not sure how what it was. But I remember the two little sparks on the right side of it went out. It was like right. just two little sparks. And I, I was like, my God, man, it sounds what like you're. What would they possibly, but this is my question. Now, either when I went to November five, either I was in the right place at the right time, or I was at the wrong place at the wrong time or the right, I guess the right time, I guess for them, I don't really know. But for me, was I at the wrong place at the right time or the wrong place at the right time for them? But what further interest could they possibly, could there possibly be in me? I don't have a clearance any longer. I'm not in that. I don't have any codes in my mind. I don't have any, anything, you know, that could possibly interest or warrant that, that kind of, uh, they're staying, yeah, they're staying involved. Yeah. You know, I, I just, I just have to try to wrestle with that. What, you know, what could that, what could I possibly have to offer? There does seem to be a, a consistency, a, 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 re, a returning quality to some of the experiencers, you know, uh, not generationally as well. Um, but also, uh, I, I, I just wonder if, I also wonder if time is the same thing to them or if it's just sort of time is a little less, you know, has a little less... Um, meaning to some of these visitors so that to us something that seems like 40 years maybe isn't that that way for them i don't know i mean i i'm wondering if you have and i and i left to the barking dog i we i don't know if we covered what you learned under hypnosis about you are missing time if that yeah. Um, help something give you, you can talk about it, or yeah, if you feel comfortable talking about it or if, uh, uh, if that gave you any insight into any future visits or this experience, for example, I can talk a little bit about that. You know, hypnosis is so speculative, you know, I mean, mm-hmm. and I'm not saying, uh, the guy that did it was from MUFON and, uh, uh, Robert Hastings arranged that for me to do that. And then, uh, That was, I guess that was the second time I was ever hypnotized, but, um, he did it, you know, where, so there was a video and an audio portion of that recording. So I have that. And, uh, there are parts of it that are just literally unnerving. And we had been through a hurricane here just previously to this, uh, hypnosis session and on, on that particular day, they were re-roofing my home because of that. And, uh, there were probably 14 people on this roof with nail guns and plywood and shingles and name it, you know, you know, the kind of noise is generated from a construction project like such as that. It's it's a really large roof and it's super high pitch. So, you know, you hear everything. And I was in my back room when it happened, uh, when they were here, I never heard it. First of all, I always questioned hypnosis, Mm -hmm. whether I could be hypnotized or not. 
I don't question it anymore because I, I think you can be hypnotized. I never thought I could be, but I was. I never heard a single hammer fall or a staple gun or anything like that while they were doing that, while he was, but in the tape or in the DVD, you can hear it. I never heard it, but it upset me so bad, fellas, that when I had to break a veil in order to describe what I was seeing and feeling, I went into AFib and didn't know it. Really? Wow. Yep. And, uh, It, uh, it, it really, really upset me. I know that at one point that I didn't have clothes on and I was placed or I was in some type of a gel. And the only thing that was not in that gel was this part of my face like this. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing. My only concern, I didn't know how long I've been laying there. I didn't know how I came to be in that. And my only concern was not to move. So my face would not go under this liquid. And it, honestly, it felt like a jello. And I, and I say it was black because there were no lights around me at any time. I was looking everywhere and everything was complete darkness. And that in itself, you know, will frighten you literally to death. There was no light anywhere. I was in just complete darkness and in this stuff that, I can't describe. And that feeling alone just had me uh, shaking, literally shaking in my boots. And I, and if I put myself right there today, it'll happen to me. I mean, I can feel it. And I have to be very careful about that. When, when I underwent hypnosis with um, uh, Yvonne Smith, with Ciro in LA, uh, when we're, when I was out there last year, I, I keep one pill that that will stop me from going into AFib or will treat me if my doctor said. And uh, I, 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 I don't take them every day. I just only take them if I feel any flutter like that. But this is much more than a flutter. This is something that comes upon you and make you weak and can't do a whole lot of things. But um uh, yeah, I remember a lot of pain, too. I just want you to know that in my right wrist. I don't know what was being placed in my right wrist, and a tall one was working on me. I think um, I think that was a male, but I did see a female. It wasn't a difference in it wasn't a difference in visuals. I just sent one to be a female and one to be a male. And these were six foot or so tall. And um, but he had my arm up. And he just, he just kept telling me, I'm not going to hurt you, but he was hurting me. He just kept saying, I'm not going to harm you, but this was whatever he was doing in, in my wrist right here. It felt as if he was driving something down into my arm. I mean, down in the middle of my way in my arm and the hand, I felt the hands on, I felt a hand on my shoulder, very long fingers. I mean, long fingers. Yeah, I just want to clarify. These are memories recovered from the uh, no South sense. Dakota, the South Dakota event. Yes, not the night, not the night that the, at your home. No, I've never, I've never been uh, asked about those. I've never been asked, you know, what took place December seventeenth, twenty seventeen. Yeah, um, but but I didn't I mean, mean to, I didn't mean to interrupt that. But I just want to make no, it clear that we were talking what what night we were talking, what event we were de describing. The. Uh, This, uh, when this one was working on me on my right side, I couldn't do anything to raise an arm. I couldn't do anything to raise a foot. I could move my eyes and I wouldn't see every single, everything. It was intermittent when I would come to and I would see because it's, it's rough. It's not, it's, uh, not kind. And, uh, it wasn't kind at all. I felt as if I was being kind of jerked around a little bit and, um, well, more than a little bit. And I, I and that's what frightened me because I, I was nothing I could do to defend myself. I don't even remember how I was, how I could breathe. You know, I mean, I, I and Michael Johnson in the second hypnosis, 
when that hand was placed here on my shoulder, it was to call me. It was a, it was a different, it was one of the smaller ones. Michael Johnson was opposite to me. I found that out through her. He was facing the opposite direction and his head was close to me also. And, uh, he asked, he asked, why am I here? And then I heard because he's here. And that was meaning me. And I don't know how else to interpret that or what else to say about that, but it was no verbal speak. It was all inside, inside me, you know, yeah. that's, that's how you're communicated to. So he was kind of collateral in this incident that this incident was. And where did he go? Yeah. 40 something years, man. No word at all. And just no, gone. Still, you've still not been able to find him. No, no. And it's looking for me. I testified yeah. to arrow last year in March 22nd, last yeah. year, 23. Yeah. Four I mean, hours and 19 minutes. Yeah. And, and they call, this is not a story any longer. Uh, this Lieutenant Colonel, who's Army CID intelligence, he said, being that this happened on duty, he said, yours is the only incident. It's not, he says, it's not a story because it happened on duty. It's an incident. It's recorded. And he told me that. Wouldn't tell me where it's being stored, but he's told, he said that that's what he said to me. And he, told, he promised me I'd get a copy of every single thing that we discussed. And I kept asking, how can you write this fast? for four hours and 19 minutes. And how many pages have you accomplished in all this? Yeah, I'd be recording it. You know, I didn't get off the banana boat yesterday, you know, no the arrow. Yeah. 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 The yeah. Arrow interview. I've, and, heard, uh, I've heard from a number of people that they, there was no uh, electronic recording. There was no like tape recordings done of these arrow interviews by anyone. I mean, I heard the same thing uh, uh, from Robert Salas. He said he was in his interview. There was no record. There was just somebody taking notes. Nobody was, re nobody was recording the interviews. That's not, that's, he was being recorded. Yeah. Yeah. He was being recorded anyway. Um, I know. But your incident. Yeah. And, and well, now I have that. Like, so are you, have you, uh, you've, probably heard about the uh, the arrow report that just came out <laughs> um, yes. i'm gonna guess you're a little dubious of its conclusions well you know i i think lou said something to me you know a while back when the, the first report came from sean kirkpatrick mm -hmm. and i shot off this text you know we have we have a group you know and i shot off something saying i can't believe it i feel like i've just been you know you, know, you try to keep this stuff secret because there are certain elements of the government. You don't want to know your business. Really? You don't. And this was supposed to be an office that did, you know, right. that's, that's what we were all led to believe. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I kind of felt a little, I was, I was pissed off to start with when I found out as I was told to this Lieutenant Colonel, he said, well, we're trying to get all this information from you first 12 people. So he can present this to Congress in two weeks when he goes in front of them. So that's the time frame you we're talking right now. Mm -hmm. So I say, well, that's cool, you know. And uh, then when that came out that there was no substantial evidence in any extraterrestrial or anything of what you know, you know what the statement was, right? Yes. Well, I shot a, I shot this text off, and Lou got a hold of it. It went to Lou, and he goes, "Well," <laughs> he says, um. I think he took it as if it was something toward what we had just accomplished out in Los Angeles. He said, do you want me to talk to somebody and do it? I said, no, 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 it's not that at all. You know, it's the fact that this guy literally lied to us to get information and to document who we are and where we are, right. which we had that anonymity to start with prior to all this happening. Mm -hmm. You know, so now they have me officially categorized somewhere and cataloged yeah and and that information is someplace and it, that makes me feel a little uneasy that they've got that because you know I'm, i i hate to say this but they can twist and turn anything they want in any way in which they want yeah. and uh 
I, uh, I've got some injuries when, when I was in the service, I, I've gone through the VA and I just, I didn't do it when I, you know, early in my life, I've just done it as I'm reaching the end of and soon to retire. And, uh, I have some disabilities, uh, from injuries that I did incur. And, uh, they did not want to hear any part of that concerning PTSD. You know, the, over this incident, they, they just, they can't even, they don't even have an office that can recognize speak like that right. like this. Well, I saw an object. Well, what kind of object we don't recognize, you know, a UFO or a U and I still call them UFOs. I'm not with the UAP thing. Mm -hmm. I know what a UFO is. And, uh, but anyway, so they do other things in order to award you something in lieu of, I just, yeah. I'll say now, that. You, now you say you have injuries with the, the injuries were incurred during this time that you had this encounter with these entities. Uh, well, the only in injuries that I had, of course, would, you know, would be the actual occurrence of it itself, mm -hmm. the burns on my body yeah. and, uh, and that, but I, I got thrown out of a deuce and a half <laughs> coming from the weapons range one day and myself and two other guys got thrown out the back end of a deuce and a half truck coming from leaving a range. Mm -hmm. Uh, in Korea and uh, landed so hard on an M16, I bent the barrel and uh, yeah, it hurt me and it hurt my back and I'm, you know, lower back and I've had problems from it ever since. So I've been treated for, they treated me for it while I was in the service. So they recognize that. Now, what's funny is when the investigators, uh, you go, they use a different organization, the VA does in order to do, you know, your, your uh, evaluations. Each, each agency is a little bit different, but, uh, the uh, the person that was doing my medical research, things in 77, there was a flight surgeon's office examination. Uh, and I can't believe what the outcome of that was. I didn't get that in any writing. Mm -hmm. And she told me, she told me, she goes, uh, this part I can't give you. The other stuff I can. And I said, well, what is it? She wouldn't even let me look at it. And what, what would that possibly have hurt her from or hurt her for, you know, let me see the screen, you know, and she goes, well, yeah, you were treated in 77. Looks like for some burns. When she said that my, my spidey senses just jumped up because that's part of it, you know? Yeah. And, uh, I just wanted to see that documentation, but she wouldn't let me have that. Yeah, because yeah, why wouldn't you? It's in the record. It's, it's in the just record. puts it puts it in the reality of the yeah. government, the military. It's an yeah. incident. It happened. You don't need to you right. know, try to justify your experience mm -hmm. at all. And yeah. it should any. And I went four years. Um, I went four years before I got this letter from Rick Doty. Yeah, four years. I've been trying to track him down to some acknowledgement that he was there, and I wouldn't let up on him for nothing. Yeah. And he finally came through and well, now he's agreed to do this other incident, you know, to do this thing. Yeah. Well, he's, he's, the, he's kind of the Forrest Gump of the UFO world. Yeah. Uh, he's like, shows yeah. up everywhere. Um, everywhere. That's a, I had a question. That's a very dark. Yeah. That's so dark. Sorry. I go ahead, Dave. No, I just I had a question about something you said earlier when, when, uh, in the, the memory, in the uh, hypnotic regression, when, um, uh, your partner asked why he was there and, and their response was because you were there. Mm -hmm. um, do you feel like maybe this incident wasn't random that it was that they were there for you from the outset yeah. that, that they yeah. were Robert there Hastings. that first time Robert you Hastings. saw them at the distance and you were flashing the light to them they were already knew who you were mm -hmm. and they were there to they were there to have an encounter yes, with you totally believe it yeah totally feel it not alone just believe it I feel it yeah but my question was, you know, this thing that happened December 17th, 2017, mm -hmm. what could I possibly have left? What, what, what could they possibly want from me at this point in the game? You know, yeah. I don't know what it was at that point, other than biological materials that's used in their breeding program or whatever it could have been. Yeah. Cause uh, I mean, that's what, that's the way you have to think, you know, I mean, yeah. Well, the people, I mean, people that are having abducted experiences come from every walk of life. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Uh, school teachers and mm -hmm. you know, and lawyers and policemen and you know, yeah. you know, it's well, now my I'm, father. You know, he was he was fifty percent fifty percent Mayan, mm -hmm. so I've got that twenty five percent in me. 
Yeah. And I don't know if that means a thing, but I've been in, I've been, uh, I've got a really good friend. That's a Hopi Indian, hundred percent from four corners. And we talk about this stuff all the time. And you know, it's amazing the knowledge that they have of the stars, but yet never studied astronomy. It's, it's simply taught to them from birth, yeah. you know, the star people and what they're doing here and why they're here. They don't mess with them. They could be standing right next to them. They could, you know, as he told me in the past, he said, they've actually landed and walked up to their, to their campfires their teepees, you know, and shared time and communion with them. You know, I'm like, wow. You know, it, it, and really this guy is, is really amazing. He says they, they see something in you that they needed or they wanted, or they, you know, there's a reason. Yeah. I'm wondering if, and I think there's some, you know, and it, it's a, I don't know if a parallel track or a, or a, but you know, this was, you were a security officer at a nuclear site, right? Was there ever to your knowledge, um, or anything you learned subsequently with arrow or that discussion about this incident? Because we know, uh, from other stories that UAP or UFOs have reportedly turned missiles on and off that they have they have kind of messed with the systems where did you ever get a sense that any of that had occurred uh during your incident absolutely many there times was, there was i'm going to want to cover something that most people don't even talk about and 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 only someone serving and there and being a security policeman could ever tell you now there was a procedure when these missiles go into a countdown literal countdown by themselves, uncontrollable, mm -hmm. uncontrollable countdown. They can't understand why all of a sudden this thing goes into a launch sequence. Well, they picked that phone up and they called the flight security controller upstairs, said, get your art team out there, your arm response team to whatever site, say, no, say November 10, this thing's gone an auto sequence launch and we have to take steps in order to do something to the missile. This is no joke now. You grab, you grab everything as fast as you can. You're not really given a time frame. You book it out there, get on the site, open the gates, go in the site, drive right up on top of the blast door. It's ground level on the facility. It goes right up and it's flat. You go right up on top of it, put your vehicle in neutral, grab all your stuff or turn your vehicle off, leave it in neutral get off the facility and set up a mile ECP entry control point one mile away. That's if that blast door, if, if the whole sequence comes to fruition and launches and it'll blow out from underneath that truck and then that truck will fall down inside the silo and hopefully mess up the gyro in the tip of that rocket. Oh my God. And stop it. And go off errantly like an old scud missile and crash in the ground. The only time a Minuteman 2 was ever launched was in November, as that November 2, was that November 2, and I can't think of the year, and it flew for five seconds and they detonated it. You can look that up, too. It was only, That's the only time any Minuteman missile flew out of the ground in its natural silo facility to be tested to see if it would work, because it was a problem with solid fuel rockets. Okay, so it's a, a test, uh, yeah, sorry, so it's a Yeah, that was a test, yeah. and it worked. So it wouldn't so, have had a nuclear warhead yeah. on it, yeah. Right. Yeah. But that was our, that was our go-to procedure. And yeah. I probably responded to at least four of those in my three and a half years out there. Wow. Where the missiles actually cycled themselves to launch. Jeez. Order to go. And it wasn't just November. It and, was. And no one ever came up with an explanation for how this could happen. No, no. Uh, they'd send, a, they'd send a maintenance team out the next day and, you know, whatever the specialists were to go over everything to see why this thing sequenced to launch that yeah. we would go out and sit with them, you know, because anytime you had a maintenance team out there, you had to have security personnel out there too. Now, were, there, to. were there any other anomalous, uh, uh, activity, any other anomalous activity around these launches or was it just the, the launch itself? Like was, was, the was there anything else Did anyone else, did anyone see any strange craft the way you saw this, this giant sphere, like connected to these previous, uh, Oh, there's been many. Yeah. Yeah, there's been many other sightings. Yeah. Now, they weren't spherical. Some, a lot of them were large, 
saucer type, you know, but yeah. I mean, really large. So they had, so they had enough, uh, <laughs> sightings and enough, uh, unexplained countdown start that they had a procedure for it. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. pretty alarming sure on its own. That there's a yeah. Procedure. On its own. Yeah. Right. So that's just not going offline. That's a whole different, that's a whole different thing that I don't yeah. know why nobody's talked about that. I've been telling yeah. people that for years, man. I know because I responded to them and I know other people did. Yeah. You know, when I first got there, I was a newbie. I was following everybody else's footsteps, you know? Yeah. Well, there's the story of that happening in the Ukraine uh, around this, you know, I think around the same time as the Malmstrom incident. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah. The Soviet, the Soviet missiles seven. went into countdown. And yeah. they couldn't turn. They couldn't stop the countdown, and then the UF the UFO that was over top of them flew away, and the countdown ended uh, mm -hmm. on its own. Yeah, but, and just to just to clarify, but you do you do or you're not or you're not aware of whether that occurred during your missing time or anything of that nature. What I just described to you? Yeah, a kind of no. countdown or anything no. involved with no. the what we, what we were involved in was called a sit for, mm -hmm. and that's where that. And that one picture, those three ear looking things mm -hmm. that those are um, those are antennas for that ground or top umbrella uh, alarm or, or system to read anything that breaks through that umbrella. Mm -hmm. And then okay. underground, you have the A, B and C plug, which goes down to the actual missile. There's three more different plugs that different people with different codes open each one. Nobody has the combos to get in to open the whole place up. Yeah. Period. So this, so the other part of that set four was an alarm down in this vaulted area went off. Yeah. Now it was all closed up when we got there, you know, of course, but I never did go on the site. So, yeah. you know, we just pulled up to the front gate. You didn't even get, yeah. That was over get there. for but, us, you know. Do you know if, if, uh, was Arrow ever briefed on these uh, these other UFO encounters and the the countdowns, the um, launch I have no, I, Do you know? I related what I just told you. What we're talking right now is just the way I spoke with Arrow. Yeah. Absolutely the way. And there was more than one person in that room as you're speaking to them because they do make noise in the background. So you know you're not just talking to one guy. No matter what anybody says, it's being recorded, it's being written down, they're – there are phrases in there that they're looking for to identify certain other things with other people. I mean, I kind of got the breakdown of the whole of the whole thing. So I'm just relaying that to you. Mm -hmm. No, that's really interesting because yeah. I yeah. had not heard that about. Uh... Now, have you ever had any interaction with any of the uh, like other people who've had similar experiences? Uh, Absolutely. You, like Robert yeah. Salas and yeah. or any of the people yeah. at Malmstrom or mine. That is number. Yeah. 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 And many that. Uh, Several that have not even come forward yet mm -hmm. that are situations uh, much the same as mine. Yeah. I am sure you're an incredible resource for them that they can, you know, talk with you about this. And, and I'm, you know, uh, just just the fact that you've shared this incredibly unique experience, <laughs> you know, is I mean, it must be, some, you know, I don't know, a level of. Well, you know, Tom, I uh, I'm yeah, it, it, it is. And uh, and. I mean, it, it is really the whole the whole damn thing is is pretty incredible that something like this could happen to anybody. Uh, it really is. And and before I, I looked at it almost as a curse, you know, and I didn't really want to talk about it, and I kind of hid from a, a lot of things. And uh, I'd only spoke to one person about it, even even my wife. I, I didn't even tell her till I uh, got my pink slip or was laid off from the United States Department of Energy there in which I was a security inspector. I went to work for them and um, I got an 83 and I went to work for Department of Energy in 85. Mm -hmm. And uh, so these national laboratories like Los Alamos, I've been there, Sandia, um, uh, General Electric Neutron Devices, which built the triggering devices uh, for a nuclear implosion. And uh, Y-12 in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, the Oak Ridge National um, uh, Laboratory yeah. and K-25 gaseous diffusion facility where uranium was enriched there. That was in the latter ends, all the Manhattan Project. 
So I can, I can proudly say that I got the, a piece of that, you know, and, uh, mm-hmm. I never spoke about it because there again, as that non-disclosure said, that agreement mm-hmm. said, as long as I was carrying a weapon in this configuration with, to do anything with nuclear weapons and believe me, you go through the office of personnel management for a Q clearance. And they know everything. They know what shoe you tie first, man, from growing up, you know, literally. Yeah. First and second grade teachers are spoken to. And they, they get every part of your persona that they can possibly obtain but about you. And you're no longer bound by any NDAs to no. the American government. When, 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 I, when, was, when were you when relieved of that obligation? Like what year would that have been? Uh, 96. 96. 96. And I, we moved from... Uh, Oak Ridge, or really from Harriman, Tennessee, yeah. down here to uh, Brunswick, Georgia. Yeah. It's so it's, it's important. Here they, we put our Oak Ridge labor, uh, Laboratories is now where Sean Kirkpatrick is working as well. Yeah, did he, did he end up going there? Man, that sucks, really. Yeah. I don't have much respect for that guy. He was on their payroll before he left Arrow. Of course he was. It yeah. seems like well, such an old playbook that they use, and it seems yeah. like such a tired... Um, uh, tired efforts to, to just, uh, I guess, continue to, to try to muzzle this, this issue, this, this clearly widespread, you know, uh, phenomenon that is, that is, that is uh, ubiquitous in, in our skies, uh, in experiences, uh, you know, like yours, it's, it is astonishing that they keep kind of trying to, throw up uh, distracting dust and and make these sad um, efforts to, to like there's nothing to see here it's just astonishing the level of input and information they have of, of stories like of you know yours documented uh, incidents on military bases I'm just I don't know yeah I, guess do, you, I guess gonna ask, do you feel naive. do you feel optimistic about the way things are heading right now I see you you have a, a relationship with Lou Elizondo I was very oh, yeah. yeah. No, that's great. And... Call him right now. We can get him on here too. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'd love it. Yeah, I've been talking <laughs> Dr. Lou, talking about to Lou about getting him on here for a while now, but I know he's waiting to get his book done. Um, well, yeah, I should be pretty shortly. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, yeah. There's quite a few others, but, but are you, but are you, are you optimistic that things are moving in the right direction right now? That, 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 the, 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 the tide is turning and that, that through, through the people like yourself coming, forward and people like Lou Elizondo having the courage to to uh, go public with what he knows and David Grush. Do you feel like it's going to we're going to get somewhere? No, <laughs> no, I was so who, thinking you're going to say something pulling, positive and optimistic. Who is pulling? Who is pulling Kirkpatrick's strings? Yeah. Yeah. Who? Because I'm going to tell you both. I'm going to tell and Chrissy, too. I'm going to tell you right now. There are probably between six to 12 people on this planet, maybe not in this country, that know every single thing that we want to know. Mm-hmm. They're allowed to know those things. They're not in any realm that we can get a hold of them. And they would die first before they would tell you a single thing. Yeah. Would you, the, uh, would you just say these people are sort of uh, extra governmental? They're not, they're, they're operating outside yeah. or above the level of governments? Yes. Yes. That's scary. Um, it is. And you think that, yeah. uh, you think even with people with, with the, I mean, obviously we've seen an example of how someone as powerful as Chuck Schumer working with Mike Rounds could get kind of shot down by, um, by um, someone like Representative uh, Turner. Mm-hmm. But, you know, these politicians, though, yeah. Dave, I don't care who they are. I, I, honestly, we're talking about something that's completely disassociated with any political forum, any political bias, anything on the, anything that we come up with. When these beings decide to show themselves, there's nothing anybody, Schumer and the rest of them can do about it. Yeah. Because it's going to come to that point when they make the decision to either come up out of the sea or drop in from the moon or come into the atmosphere and land on that White House lawn or wherever they choose to do it. It will take all questions away at that yeah. point. Well, it seems like people, gonna happen. it seems like people like Schumer and Rounds and Rubio and Burchett and Gillibrand. All it seems like these people are trying to get us ready for that happening. Yeah, and they're being stopped. Yes, uh, and they're being Again, stopped by people with deep DOD ties. Yeah. The industrial military complex. If you, you know, one thing you need to to think about also. 
our inventions and uh, patents. Mm -hmm. What the U.S. government owns under other names and projects and what they release and when they release it, whether it be a, a new high explosive round or whether it be the most intricate thermal imaging lens in the, on the planet or listing devices or light emitting diodes. Where did that technology come from? The cell phone in your pocket, what it can do today. I mean, what, what was I just heard recently? There was something like a thousand fifty times the computing power in an iPhone eight than there was the first mission to the moon. Yeah, well, there was. There was I, I mean, think. and it took a room that was like a quarter of a mile in di in squareness to operate those old computers to do yeah. that. Yeah, I think I talked yeah. to some Apollo guys. I think they said the uh, the Apollo lander had something like fifty seven k computer capacity, like less than a Casio watch, essentially. Unbelievable. You know? But those things, those programs and projects, that's where true money comes from. That's where they can release these things as they see fit, whatever these inventions are. You know, I, I, I just heard something recently that in the Roswell crash, took 20 something years to break through the internal part of this uh, chamber where there were two beings in it. Mm -hmm. And of course, after 20 something years, you know what that must have been like. It had to be mush by that time, whatever they are. Yeah. Uh, but. Being that they were able to do that, they invented a new type of a cutter, a plasma type cutter that was able to penetrate that metal for 20, 30, 40 years that they couldn't get through it. So they just had this little pod set off to the side as what they do with all these projects. They work on them as long as they can till it reaches the technology level we are today. They can't go any further. They put it back. They wait for new and smarter people to come up with higher IQs and better training and background and imaginations. They bring it all back out and say, what can you do with this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting times. Yeah. Um, uh, I wonder as we um, <laughs> let you go after this uh, extraordinary. Yeah, thank you so uh, much for your generosity thank you. with your yeah, time. It's really, yeah. really been <laughs> really been yeah. fascinating and and uh remarkable um you you i remember you saying you had some really uh kind of apocalyptic dreams after your experience um in 77 yeah. which ranks and, uh, in my head too yeah. well yeah you and and yet you also had the no fear message come to you um initially i'm just wondering if you have a takeaway of of them of their of their um, mission intention or mission or any, yeah, any in instinct or gut feeling on that. I don't yeah. think they're here to harm us. Yeah. I don't think they're here to enslave us. I think they're doing what they need. I think there's been an agreement struck between who is it? Eisenhower perhaps. Yeah. Well, that That's they would the be allowed. Heard, yeah. yeah. They would be allowed to get certain materials from human beings. Yeah. I don't know. Well, now, there's also said to be more than one species here, which I totally yeah. believe. I, I, I really believe that. Mm -hmm. And I guess each one's on its own mission. And I don't know if, if one's more than the other. Uh, yes. And some of them maybe don't like some of the others. That's... Yeah. Yeah. And also, well, the, the, the dreams you described um, <clears throat> are exactly um, correlate to what uh, people abduct, abductees have described as these basically like almost like films that are shown to them mm -hmm. on the, on sure. when, they're, when they're on the craft, mm -hmm. when they're in the UFOs, uh, they're shown these films and they said the, the films are, are like that, the apocalyptic kind of images of, uh, of, you know, nuclear war and, you know, and just horrifying images they're shown of, or environmental damage. So the, you know, one the thing dreams that I, you described are about One thing that I find Dave in these dreams all the times, it feels as if, it feels as if you can reach up and pull it with you when you leave the dream. And it really gives you a different sense because I, 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 I take dreaming kind of seriously when I do. And, I, and it's something like this that I can remember or I, I'm, I remember whether I want to or not. And I try to write them down immediately. And I have a little log that I keep. But uh, to feel heat or to smell or to taste something in a dream is more than a dream. Yeah. 
you know, you see a nuclear explosion or an, or, a, or a huge tidal wave and all of a sudden you wake up and there's water on your face, you know, or, you know, or there, you know, you feel that way, you know, or feel the burn from a, a nuclear implosion. Yeah. It's a more, more intense and more. Yeah. Visceral. I mean, it, it, it is absolutely. Yeah. Or to see the earth covered in darkness for some reason, like, you know, something's hit it <clears throat> and all this dust is in the atmosphere and the sun doesn't get to it, you know, it doesn't get to the surface any longer. And, uh, there's been quite a few like that yeah. and, and they are very scary. No creatures or anything, just yeah. happenings with the earth itself. But or do you, Yeah. Do you feel maybe these images were put in your, in your mind while you were on board? And I don't they, know. Did they come back to you in yeah. these dreams? Or who knows? Do they or are you getting visited again? It? Maybe when yeah. you have these dreams, those are nights when you've been, those are new encounters. Wow. You would have thought of that. Wouldn't yeah. that be something? Yeah. It'd be nice to wake up during one of them and say, hey, man, what, what are you guys doing? <laughs> What's going on? Yeah. 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 Me, Let's talk about context. this. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. There's, you know, there's so much, you know, it's like archaeology. I think it's all tied in and it goes back thousands and thousands of years, not just a thousand or two years, but I mean, I mean, it goes way back. Yeah. And there's, there's been, um, what, for everything that we've uncovered so far, is only 10% of what's there. Yeah. yeah. You know, that, that ought to tell people, you know, what it, you know, look, look in India, some of the, the magnificent temples carved, well, they started in the rock and just, just cut these things right from the rock. There's not parts that have been made and brought in. It's one solid piece mm -hmm. that technology to do that, man. Yeah. Where did that come from? And what do they use? The tools are always missing. Mm -hmm. You know, the pyramids, they thought now Robert Schock says that they were at one time under a couple of hundred feet of water. Mm -hmm. You know, the Sahara Desert was not the Sahara Desert, you know, 10,000, 15,000 years ago. It was trees and everything else there. So that's all new sand. So what's underneath all that? Yeah. Central and South America, same way. Yeah. Antarctica. Man, that now you're opening a can of worms. Mm -hmm. You know, Antarctica, I think if we were shown well just what's in Antarctica, all your questions would be answered. Yeah. Well, and even just the fact that we have all the all the sort of indigenous uh people's uh traditions. The Dogon tribe. Yeah, they include stories of these, you know, star yeah. people and they they, mm -hmm. they include stories of flying saucers and and uh beings and yeah. uh and 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 consciousness encounters that you know that uh that they're able that they still feel like you know they're able to communicate with these beings whenever they whenever they wish and, and they may be doing it yeah but i still believe and i have i got I, I i have a pretty good circle of people that are that are pretty knowledgeable but the first time I ever heard that between six and 12 people on this planet know everything. Now, yeah, that's who cool. are they and how yeah. did they obtain that ranking to know that? And, you know, how old are, where are these yeah. guys? Where are can, they? Can you say, where, can you say where you, where you heard that information? Yeah, I, uh, I'm not going to give you the location. Well, I'll tell you, I heard it in California. Uh huh. But you can't tell us from what, so, from whom? I'd rather not. Yeah. Okay. Well, not. I know it's not Dave and I, no, even though no. we are currently in California, <laughs> yeah. we, but we're, yeah. we are anxiously trying to learn and uh, <laughs> find out who these gatekeepers are. But I don't, uh, look, I don't doubt it because uh, it's been a pretty well-kept secret for quite a long time. And, think and, uh, I think these six or 12 people, I think, honestly, you can, I, I think they would probably be, probably be dangerous to go after to try and locate. Mm -hmm. Were they all at one point members of Menudo? Could have very well been. Oh, well, that, no, no, no. <laughs> because I've always been a little bit afraid of those people. Yeah. I don't know, but uh, yeah, that, that, those people exist and they know everything. Yeah. How do you get charged uh, with that? Wouldn't wouldn't you just like to be a fly on the wall in that one of those meetings? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I'd like Sounds to like um, be dangerous. 
uh, you know, I'd, I'd like to say I, I wish at anybody, I've always done this, if Michael Johnson is out there, you know, my, my email is mwoods175 at gmail.com. And I'd throw my phone number out there right now, but I learned a valuable lesson not doing that. Mm -hmm. um, you can email me. If anybody knows yeah. a Michael Johnson, a uh, probably a 68 to 70 year old uh, light skinned black guy. If anybody's mm -hmm. ever known anybody with that name, please send me an email. Right. We'll, 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 put, you guys, even. we'll put that up. We'll put that up on the on the screen please. when we when we when we cut this together, and uh, we, maybe we can put it up in the in the uh, the links as well. I would love that. It yeah. would really. Yeah. And I, I've got a lot of people that help me too. I, uh, Rob Heatherly, he's a good friend of mine, really good guy. He uh, uh, and I got another guy named Anonymous. He's a uh, I won't say his name because he's anonymous. That's and the, uh, I, yeah, I I follow Shadow. him. He's on and, the uh, He uh, d they both do research for me whenever I ask some things, and they literally can pull stuff out that I've never even knew existed, and, and it really. It really helps me in furthering this whole thing along because I, I do get asked a lot of questions and I, I, uh, it's important when you can verify something, you know, with the help of someone else, you can't do it all alone. You know, I can, I can barely put this together and, you know, and I need, uh, there's so much more, you know, you need to do in, in a presentation like this. And, uh, just, you know, life is going on at the same time while you're trying to do this too. So it, it makes it pretty difficult, you know, and, yeah. uh, but I, I just appreciate, you know, really people asking me these questions and, you know, bringing me on, uh, like this. And, and so we can discuss this because the world really needs to know. And yeah, it's been going on. And I, th I think we're coming to a point you know, do you ever know, you ever notice, um, have you ever looked at how the planets follow the sun? Have you ever looked at that? Have you ever looked at a scientific, uh, 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 I guess a display of how, you know, the sun's out there and then all the planets are following behind. It's like a DNA strand. If you look at it from a distance in a drawing, right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I never knew that. I just thought, well, the sun's just sitting there. I didn't know we we're moving at 70,000 miles an hour. And the sun's just sitting out there in the middle and we're all just going around it, right? Well, that's not how it is at all. Yeah. And a lot of people don't know that. I had a guy tell me the other day in an argument that the moon, the moon now, that we circle the moon. The moon did not circle the earth. And let me tell you, he was ready to fight over it. Yeah. It, he said, Mario, you're wrong. He said, the Earth orbits the moon. Yeah. I, said, There's I, no I think I only saw recently a, 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 a diagram of what the actual solar system looks like, like how mm -hmm. kind of the planets are. We look at the, we look at the lower circles. Yeah. left corner. Yeah. yeah. Now, I will ask you guys a question. Do you ever look at any of these NASA uh, uh, videos or photos of things concerning, you know, we have that EASA -E camera or satellite that looks d directly at the sun filtered and you can see some things there. Yeah. The, I've seen, and, uh, definitely seen a lot of those videos of strange objects you, orbiting you the seen, sun and or, or seemingly drawing off energy from the sun and that sort of thing. Yeah. And that, that, and these things are they're the size of our planet. Yeah. Wherever they are. But here about two months ago, uh, I got sent a, uh, a video, uh, I wish I, I don't know if I saved it or not. I'll have to try to look. In fact, if I can find it, I'll, I'll send it to you. Please. And it's of the sun, the stationary telescope that looks at the sun. EASA, I think is what it's called through NASA. And there's an object on the lower right hand corner that's moving and it's moving really fast. And it impacts the back part of the sun, which you can't see. And then at the top of the, at the top of it, you see this eruption shoot out the back end of it like that. So whatever it was, it slammed into the sun. Now, what could possibly be big enough that would interact with the solar surface like that and blow out blow something out the back of it? I mean, it showed it. And I was like, man, this is unreal to see something like this. Yeah. Yeah. There's stunning stuff out there. And it's just, um, 
There is. Yeah, it's 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 an amazing mystery, and it's going to be an amazing few years, I think, moving forward. We live um, in a unique time. Yeah, we sure are. Um, I just, and I just uh, want to be here when they make themselves known. I just hope I live long enough. Yeah, I I feel the same way. Yeah, they might. I'd yeah, like to know I mean, what's going I, on. at least a little bit of what's going on. Just a little bit. I uh, thank you for your service, by the way, oh, and thank you for your courage with coming forward with you know with your story. And again, I hope we can maybe yeah. rely on you if we have questions, or you know, just yeah. continue that yeah. chain of resources. You know, of of trying to be informed, or you know, uh, hopefully this is the the first of a ongoing conversation because this was really yeah really, really great, fascinating. Great to meet you, and great yeah. Mm-hmm. And I, I mean, I've 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 been interested in your story for some time, and it's really great to get to talk to you. I'd like to add one more thing that I, that I think you guys will find interesting, and I appreciate everything oh, you just sure. said. You know, things just fly upon me, so I just want to throw this out there. You know, uh, leaving the Air Force and going to work for Department of Energy, you go through the whole clearance investigation with the Office of Personnel Management, OPM. So you know OPM goes through your military record. They find everything. So that incident was covered under their in their investigative right. prowess that they do. Mm-hmm. So all my friends that were hired with me at the same time at General Electric Neutron Devices, we were all getting our Q clearances. You know, everybody does this. I mean, it's like 15 pages or something like that when you complete it. Not adding, you know, any uh, uh, additional paperwork and stuff you sent in. All your addresses you ever lived in. But they'd get their clearance. They got their clearance in sometimes a month, sometimes three months, you know, four months. It took eight months to obtain my clearance. Mm-hmm. And I had a secret clearance in the Air Force, not a top secret. And it only required a secret intact working missiles. I never had any direct hands on a nuclear device. I was always in a two man zone and always in a in a in a situation to where, you know, I didn't put my hands on anything. Let's mm-hmm. put it that way. And uh, so with Department of Energy, when you start this clearance procedure, you know, they may call you in six or seven times or whatever to ask you for clarification or anything. And I got called in three times in those eight months of waiting that queue clearance. And each time it was a different type of questioning about what I saw in 77 or it really wasn't what I saw. It was what did you have a strange experience in 1977 while you're in the U.S. Air Force station in South Dakota at Ellsworth Air Force Base, South Dakota? And my answer always was the same because I knew had I really gone into this whole thing that we're talking about right now, I'd have never gotten that clearance. Mm-hmm. They'd walk you right out the front door. And we're talking a really high paying job, especially in 1985 uh, with benefits and everything else working for these contractors. That was really good. And it was uh, where I needed to be. And, um, but in those eight months, I was called in no less than three times to clarify anything else that I could think of that happened in 1977. They already knew. They right. wanted to know if I was living by that non-disclosure agreement that I signed, and I was not discussing that yeah. even with them. And I just kept saying, no, there's nothing else I need to tell you or say. Yeah. But after it was awarded me after eight months, a year later, they did a new clearance. And every three or four years, instead of five years, they redo them again or redo it again. So it never, it never ends. It, ne- yeah. it never ends anything. And I never discussed that. Well, I should say only one person that worked in DOE ever knew what I've told you tonight. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's a really good friend of mine. He's also my sensei in martial arts. So oh, really? Yeah. Oh, nice. My black well, belt. I think it's good, good for you. Congrats up. on that. Thank you. He, uh, yeah. But got to point out that that there's, it's very unlikely that if uh, DOE had any doubts about your competency or your credibility, you would have never made it through that screening process. Correct. So they, in, in a way, it's them. Um, I also find it kind of curious that they. Story. Yeah, it's both confirming your story and and I find it interesting that that might have even been interesting to them or or something that i don't know um perhaps so of course there again I, you know I, I never mentioned what i saw out the right window 
to yeah. DOD or to DOE. I never, and I never discussed it with Department yeah. of Energy. Yeah. I just knew better. I just, you know, I mean, here I we we moved to Tennessee for that job from Tampa, Florida, and um, I wanted to make sure I kept it. You know, yeah, sure, and, of course. And, and they're tough on stuff like that. I've yeah. seen guys lose their clearances over fishing without a fishing license, you know, and ruin their whole lives, man. I mean, literally. Yeah. So I was, you got to be very careful in what you say and how you say it. But uh, and then in, um, I guess. It, well, I didn't say anything to anybody about it. I, I told my wife about it in 95. I'm sure she thought I was absolutely nuts. I took her camping and told her. I didn't know how else to do <laughs> she's, yeah, she's, So she's stuck in a tent in the um, woods. Yeah. She thought I was absolutely crazy. But um, it wasn't until really about uh, 2010 when I first, this is a strange story, I sent it to, um, I, I Remember when, uh, let's see, I got my first computer was a Dell. No, no, it was a gateway. I stand corrected in like mm-hmm. 96 or 97. I mean, just a penny of 90. I paid like $3,600 for this thing. Mm-hmm. And one of the first people I ever wrote, of course, I sent that report to MUFON three times. Never got a word back on MUFON ever. And then I, I remembered uh, uh, Linda Moulton Howe. So I sent her an email. I didn't hear anything from her. And it was around 2014 or 2015. I'd sent something to her again and she was in, she's in Albuquerque. And I, I didn't hear anything back from her. Then all of a sudden one day in like 2018, my phone rings, right? I have the same phone number since 2014 or something. I don't know. And she goes, are you Mario Woods? And I said, yeah. She told me a story that she had, um, she had hired somebody to work for her at her home in her home office while she had to go to New York or something for some family business. And this guy, uh, he had received my email and put it in a file cabinet and it was an old gray metal file cabinet. And I guess things moved on and he went on and never mentioned it to her. And it sat in that file cabinet for years. She found it one day clearing out them. She called me up out of breath. She's like, what? This is good. <laughs> Oh my God, she was she was going. It was it was really funny, but and I ended up doing a two part uh, episode with her, and it was a lot of fun. But you know, I told her, I said, Linda, I said I, I used to try to get in touch with you about these cattle mutilations, you know, because I did witness two of those, and I was with a guy named Mark Wade. He was my team leader at Kilo Control when I first saw him, and um, and of course there was some local law enforcement there, and a the rancher was there. I've I've never seen a cow on its back. I thought it was physically impossible for their legs to be straight up in the air, but I saw it my own two eyes, and that's the truth. Yeah, there wow. was no blood, no nothing, you know, no blood in the general area. Things were moved from them. And I talked to my veterinarian in Rapid City uh, one time. I took my cat there to be uh, looked at, and and I asked him about that. And those veterinarians in, in South Dakota, you know, they, they handle everything, whether it be owls, you know, or birds of prey and, cats, dogs, donkeys, horses, everything. Mm -hmm. And he said he had seen several and he couldn't believe the state in which he found or was shown these creatures or these cows and steers in, you know, no blood, no tongue, no anus. But this was in a a separate time. Mm -hmm. When was this that you, when was, when? when? I was probably 78 or 78. Okay, so around all in that time, yeah, yeah. around the same ranches, mm-hmm. around the same, yeah. yeah. Wow. So there's more more anomalous activity in that area. Oh, big yeah. time! Yeah, well, I know there's, um, yeah, because I think I mean there have been literally um, tens tens of thousands of of uh, uh, mutilations, cattle mutilations mm-hmm. over the over the decades, and what, yeah. And, I, and, I'm and, and you got to figure cows are expensive, so every single one of those that's killed is that's a that's a felony offense, <laughs> yeah. right? And yet, yeah. still, uh, not in all these decades that this has been going on, uh, there's never been a single arrest. No, never. Right? Yeah, I don't think you can say that about any other crime. That's wild. Not one arrest yeah. ever. What do you guys think about um, Skinwalker Ranch? I'm very intrigued. I want to go. I keep trying. <laughs> I'm well, my to wife doesn't want me to go. I, I'm with you, Tom. I, I was huh. I was told I could go if I wanted to, and uh, somebody was going to arrange that. And someone else contacted me and said, "You know, Mario, you might want to reconsider that." 
Yeah. He said, because people have gone and then they've left and something goes with them. Yeah, the hitchhikers. Or things happen to them. And I don't want to chance that, man. I've had, I've had, you've had that. enough. You've, 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 you've done your tour that. of duty on that front. Yeah, I would yeah. think so. I mean, yeah. I, unless you're, you know, wanting to kind of, test the magnets of that experience with some phenomenon there. I mean, I, I'm fascinated by it. I think it's a real time investigation of something yeah. legitimate. And, and George, George Knapp and Jeremy Corbell are, are uh, friends and who have mm-hmm. deep ties to, to Skinwalker over the yeah. years. Yeah. Um, especially yeah George, George going back to the nineties. Yeah. Yeah. You've been interviewed oh. by George. Yeah. I was on coast to coast with him. I, you know, yeah. And uh, Jeff Goodrich, he's he's a real good guy. He was on there with me, and he's in the uh, little circle of twelve that we have. You know, it's uh, he's a real good guy. He saw some triangular craft that were phenomenal, though. Over, uh, I think it was over Minot where he was located. Yeah, directly five of them, and a bunch of officers saw him with him. You know. Yeah, uh, yeah, and uh, well, and uh, yeah, well, I said for myself, uh, Jeremy, Jeremy, and I actually saw a craft together a few years yeah. back wow yeah so it was a, a odd that we would see it together and it was the first yeah. time either first time either of us had ever seen anything you know uh, my father used to tell me of craft under the sea when i was a boy i just laughed at him i said dad nothing can fly under the sea he said son everything's flying under the sea <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right, you know? but he said oh yeah he said yeah. they've seen them come up and come out of the water Look at that ship. Twenty nine crewmen on line on the side of the ship, looking at them, looking at a craft, and it just gone. Yeah, no, I mean, and they're straight uh, away or straight up. Tim Tim Galladet is that how you pronounce his name? Galladet, yeah. Uh, who's at for Admiral T- Tim Galladet? Um, yeah, he's talked about uh, sonar tracking uh, things zipping past our submarines mm-hmm. at eight hundred miles an hour. Yeah, um, yeah. and not uh, even carrying a wake with it. Yeah. How, do you, how can you not displace a wake? I mean, if you passed anything at that speed under the water, you'd tear it apart. Yeah. And our submarines travel around 30 to 40 miles an hour. Mm-hmm. Our fastest submarines. Yeah. You know, the technology gap. Who was it telling? Who was I talking to about that? I better not say his name either. But uh, <laughs> he said, uh, there is no way. He said he's heard people talk about this. 100, 200 year difference in our technologies. He said it's thousands of years, Mario. He said it's not 100 or 200 years. We will not be there in 200 years. We'll have some cool stuff in 200 years. But what he was addressing was thousands of years different to us. I find it fascinating. Do you, did you say your your father saw a craft come out of the water and oh, yeah. on this ship? Yeah. So, there's a, so there's a generational... Oh, absolutely. Co- component to this. And yeah. as a boy, as a boy playing with his friends and cousins, they saw a white, red haired, tall, robed individual floating through the jungle in, <laughs> in Honduras. Wow. And they followed him until he turned around and looked at him. And they all scurried around, took off. He had really long red hair. And he was about three feet off the ground. It was probably about seven to eight foot tall. And that's what he told me as he told me that. Yeah. Well, that's again, this is fitting into the UA, uh, the mm-hmm. UAP narrative that, that, yeah. that these things, these incidents, these experiences are passed on from, father, yeah. you know, from father to son, mother to daughter. And these, these occur in families. I also think that people have a direct connection. Like I have, I have, somebody that's very, very, very close to me that's had a similar experience to me. Mm-hmm. And uh, I can I can sense, I don't know how it is, I can sense her and uh, and and her and her me as well. It's it's really a strange yeah. connection. And, uh, and your your as your son had experiences? He's had really strange dreams. Now, my daughter has. My daughter says that when she lived here, she had two little guys come in there in her bedroom. Yeah. Now, she's 34 years old today, and she still asks me about that. She, you know, she's got a scientific mind on her, you know, and she she questions a lot of things. and, And she knows there's 
I, I think she knows more than she wants to say, but yeah. she told me about that. And she's also seen something out over St. Simon's Island one night when they were on down by the uh, beach on the east, on East beach, they call it. And just her and another, uh, another girl that were out there and like three o'clock in the morning, they saw something just above the water and it went down in, it went down into the water. And uh, that was probably five, six years ago when she told me that. Uh, so, well, this really fits into the notion that the the, uh, the sphere yeah, that came amazing. out to your to uh, to the base there was was there for you. Yeah, I think that, that's, that this it. Is, seem, this the size of it is so phenomenal, though. I mean, how, how does something like that? Uh, how can I, I guess with the power source in which they have, or any gravity, or whatever they've got, electromagnetism, whatever you want to call it, but. How does something that large stay just 10 feet off the ground? How come there were not legs out there supporting it as we would have to do? And how can it yeah. just reduce yeah. gravity like that? Yeah. And now, you know, the noise, it wasn't a, it was a hum, but it wasn't a noise. Yeah. Mm, not even that. It was higher pitched than that. But the feeling of that electrical stir in the air literally raised the hairs on your arm. It, it mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it seems like the seems like the whatever's going on here, they they have taken an interest in your family, going back to your at least to your dad. Yeah, and, you know, and 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 maybe down at least as far as your daughter so far, and your son's had some. You said he's had some experiences too. Yeah, he hasn't really talked to me much about it, but uh, he's had, he's had something go on, and I think one day he'll he'll tell me about it. Yeah, and he's a he's a big boy. <laughs> I mean. He, it sounds like this guy, this yeah. guy is huge, man. <laughs> yeah, you, you, it's good. It's good to have one of those big guys around the house to, you, just to back you up. Yeah. You know, you're, you're, not, a, you're not a tiny fellow yourself. No, yeah, exactly. second degree black belt. I mean, <laughs> yeah, technical shooter. Like I mean, that's what yeah. we do. My hobbies are Speaking, radio control, car yeah. racing, and tactically shooting, and riding my motorcycle and bicycle. You know, I love to do those things. Yeah. Speaking as that's a tiny awesome. man, yeah, you're you're a, you're a big fella. <laughs> <laughs> But Dave, you've got that, you know, you got that toughness. You got that uh, grit, Dave. Right. Yeah. You got that grit, yeah. baby. I've got I have a lot Don't more leg it. strength than you'd expect. That's a, I, it's, oh, it's yeah, true. a lot more. I've yeah. seen you jump. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, okay. This again, let's do this again, I hope. Uh, yeah. yeah, this Love has you. been uh, this has been fantastic. Unbelievable. Thank yeah. you well, so I'm, much. I'm glad I I'm uh, glad I could be here with you fellas and, and Chrissy, all the best. And thank you for, yeah. for allowing me the time to be with y'all. 